Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon, Nadine. Can you hear us well? Just have always. I can. Can you hear me? Wonderful. Perfectly. Yes. Um, I was wondering if you could please introduce yourself um, and actually the, both the formation has been named before, but we don't have the depth of the high-level panel and how it came about and how is it task, please. Sure, um, and thank you for having me. Um, so my name is Nadim Houri. I'm a, a human rights lawyer currently working as the executive director of the Arab Reform Initiative. Uh, it's a leading think tank working on democratic reforms and human rights in the Middle East and North Africa. Previously, uh, I worked at Human Rights Watch for 14 years, including as deputy director of the MENA uh, program, and also later as director of the terrorism and counterterrorism program. Uh, I say this by way of background because I've, I've worked on uh, defending freedom of expression, um, and generally media freedom in very different contexts, from authoritarian countries to democracies using uh, counter-terrorism laws to muzzle uh, certain legitimate forms of expression. I'm appearing uh, before you today as a member of the high-level panel uh, of legal experts on media freedom, um, and specifically as the author of the high-level on uh, how to promote more effective investigations into abuses against journalists. Now, the high-level panel is an independent uh, and diverse group of leading lawyers and judges uh, who were convened starting in July 2019 to provide advice and recommendations to state members of uh, what is uh, known as the Media Freedom Coalition and its partners, which include a number of international organizations. Now, the Media Freedom Coalition, um, I believe it was introduced to you, but it was, it's a group of, uh, of countries that came together uh, from different uh, parts of the globe to promote and protect a vibrant free press and to really see how to raise the cost uh, to those who target journalists for their work. And the uh, high-level panel of legal experts, we uh, provide uh, advice to uh, this coalition um, through very detailed reports on how they can make their contributions more effective. Now, specifically, the report I authored uh, really tried to develop recommendations to how to uh, strengthen at the international level uh, the efforts uh, to promote effective investigations into attacks on journalists and to really tackle this persistent impunity, which, you know, we've been discussing and that I think today on November 2nd is a good moment to think about how to address it. I just want to conclude by saying, you know, the report was based on extensive consultations with key stakeholders, uh, obviously journalists themselves, but also uh, civil society, UN representatives, uh, UN special rapporteurs, um, and it was endorsed by a number of key institutions um, and individuals. Thank you. I, I think it would be worth, if you don't mind, walking as you speak, spoke a little bit about the methodology, but how, uh, what were the goals of that report and perhaps the findings? And ultimately, because I know a little bit about the report, the recommendations as they will shed light on, on the impunity issue that we've been addressing. All day. Sure. You know, thank you very much. So really, the, the report um, tried to answer a couple of fundamental questions. Um, why are there so few uh, attacks on journalists, and particularly uh, murder of journalists, that actually get successfully investigated and prosecuted? And I'm sure you've been hearing the statistic of 86% of killings of journalists go unpunished. Um, and so we set out by trying to look at what's been written. Uh, around uh, this issue. And here there's been, over the last decade, a very rich production, an important production by UN bodies, by civil society, by academics, looking at it in very different contexts. And what we found uh, first is that this rampant impunity was not limited to countries experiencing armed conflict or general coll collapse of the rule of law. So it's not just you know the Syrias or, or Iraq, uh, uh, or Mali's of this world. But actually, since 2017, most killings of journalists are occurring outside war zones, in places like Mexico, Philippines, and even in places that 
I would say historically would have been considered uh, safe for journalists like Malta. Um, secondly, um, and maybe this was one of the key disturbing you know, uh, aspects that comes out of the report, is that the situation is not getting better despite uh, multiple and important initiatives uh, at the international, but also in many cases regional and national levels over the last decade to raise the profile of the issues. So there's a real disconnect there. Um, so we're talking more about the issue. We know more about killings of journalists. We know more about attacks on journalists. And yet we're not seeing this increased knowledge, this better reporting translate into uh, more successful prosecutions. Um, and so the report tries to answer this and reviews a lot of case studies uh, and other reports. And, and basically, um, you know, the, the two aspects that come out is there are really two reasons why it's not getting better. Uh, one is obviously the lack of capacity uh, of, of those who are trying to conduct these investigations in many contexts. And this could be often due to ineffective institutions uh, or corruption, uh, which basically render authorities in a way uh, unable or often unwilling to really investigate. Um, you know, they're not the prosecutors and investigators are often too slow to get to the crime scene. There's an inability to uh, properly protect the crime scene or to, to, you know, to secure it in many ways, to analyze new forms of evidence, including things like digital evidence. But really, most importantly, there's a lack of willingness and, and maybe even capacity to interrogate powerful suspects. So that was one of the big uh, reasons, one of the big factors for the ongoing failure of connected investigations. The second one, uh, probably uh, as important, if not more, is what we found time and time again is the lack of political will to pursue accountability. And again, I mean, this should come as no surprise. Journalists who are attacked are usually attacked because they bother those in powerful places. And this is across the world in different contexts. Uh, and actually, in approximately one out of four murders, the prime suspects uh, have been government or military officials. And these sorts of suspects have the capacity uh, to, um, in a way, block or derail investigations. Um, and so at every step of the way of any investigation into an attack on journalists, we found powerful interests trying to delay, uh, deviate, slow down um, the, the investigation. And what was surprising is that despite the increased attention to the issue internationally, we found that to date, there's still very little to almost no international cost for governments and officials that actually purposely block or undermine investigations into attacks on, on journalists. So these were some of the main findings. Uh, should I just jump quickly into some of the uh, main recommendations? That, absolutely, please. Uh, I think the, so the, the recommendations, you know, again, how do you break this vicious uh, circle? Our recommendations really focus at, rec at international level, you know, systemic global uh, way of approaching things. Um, and I should start by saying, you know, uh, many people told us, well, you know, you have to invest in doing local capacity building for national police and national judiciary. Of course, this is very, very important. But we know that this takes a very long time. And frankly, in many countries where this was done uh, in terms of capacity building projects, despite the importance of this, we actually found that it had very little impact on results. Why? Because of the uh, political aspect of it, the political blockages that were being presented. This was not, you know, yes, you needed the technical skills, but it was not enough. So what does the report actually uh, recommend? So the, the main recommendations, if you want, the top line is to, is to call for the creation of a standing and a permanent uh, uh, multilateral investigative task force that would have international experts uh, that are actually specialized in various aspects of criminal investigations and prosecutions. 
You know, they could be forensic experts, they could be, uh, you know, online evidence gathering experts, they could be uh, experts in building a case for complicated, complex cross-border attacks on journalists that can quickly deploy to crime scenes to then assist uh, national, regional, or international investigations into attacks on journalists. Um, now, um, this sort of assistance could be for very uh, specific criminal investigations, individual cases, or they could also deploy to actually address systemic issues in certain countries. For instance, if a country is uh, wants support in building a witness protect uh, protection program, or they want to have more uh, support on particular forensic aspects of it. Uh, now, why this recommendation? I mean, one, we've seen in other contexts, particularly in, in cases like uh, investigations on countering terrorism or cross-border organized crime, that sending international experts to support uh, criminal investigations, to assist local investigations, can actually have very positive results. The problem is when these deployments are done in an ad hoc manner, uh, on a case-by-case -case basis, they often require lengthy negotiations and by the time the team is built up and ready to deploy, the key elements of the evidence that are needed to be gathered uh, would have uh, you know, disappeared or been hidden. So it's really important to have something that's ready to, to, to deploy uh, immediately. Now, where should such a task force reside? Now, ideally, in a standing international task force dealing with a global problem such as impunity for attacks on journalists would actually exist with a UN mandate. Um, and we would definitely welcome one as such. But at the same time, the report and, and the panel recognized that regrettably, the creation of a permanent new UN investigative body. So this would not just be a human rights reporting, but this would actually be a body that can assist in criminal investigations, um, does not seem to have uh, political support. And that the crisis uh, of impunity for attacks on journalists needed something to be addressed much more quickly. So we need to work on an alternative. That's why we actually recommend that countries that are committed to freedom of uh, the media, to freedom of expression, and to actually protecting journalists should set up their own multilateral investigative task force. Think of it as sort of the, a coalition of the, of the willing, uh, of the committed. Um, and now this task force, obviously, it will not have its own jurisdiction, right? It's, think of it as a Swiss army knife. It, so it, it will be a task force that would uh, intervene in investigations um, uh, based on a request from uh, an entity that would actually have a uh, jurisdiction or a mandate. And this could be a national body, so a prosecutor, or uh, it could also be regional bodies, because we, we note in the report that there are a number of regions that have developed uh, uh, you know, mechanisms for protecting journalists, so they could call in uh, on this. Or it could be an international entity, such as existing you know, UN special rapporteurs or others. And really, the idea would be sort of to fill this gap in the need for uh, investigation, uh, investigators. Um, and countries that support it would obviously need to commit financial resources, or if they're unable to commit funds, they would at least make available some key qualified nationals, such as investigators. And the advantage of such a multilateral body really carried by regional champions of free expression is you'd have a much wider pool of talents and skills than any uh, bilateral effort of support. So you could have, uh, you know, in Latin America, perhaps some, some countries sending uh, prosecutors that have the language that know the local context, uh, maybe police officers who understand the context of investigating for attacks on journalists uh, in South America, just to give you a, a, an example. Um, secondly, the second uh, recommendation, I'll go faster, looked at, um, you know, it recognizes that in recent years, we really saw, uh, we really see uh, many non-governmental organizations, NGOs and civil society, which traditionally focus on protecting journalists by doing human rights reporting, they've really started to expand their work to do uh, gathering evidence for criminal prosecution purposes. Uh, and increasingly, they're even signing MOUs to, and to cooperate with prosecutors to help bring uh, legal cases against perpetrators. Um, now, these evidence gathering efforts really open new possibilities. 
Uh, we've also seen it particularly in the very rich field of uh, online investigator investigations where civil society has managed to use uh, online uh, available evidence to really crack cases uh, in places that are very hard to reach. So while this is very uh, promising, um, there are also a number of pitfalls. Uh, how do you make sure that this evidence being gathered by NGOs is actually acceptable and admissible in courts? How do you also make sure that the uh, witnesses who are being talked to are being protected? How do you avoid re-traumatization uh, of victims and witnesses and, and avoiding conflicting statements? And so this is why the report you know, recognized this important new player in the scene in terms of gathering evidence, but calls on uh, countries, multilateral institutions, and NGOs to develop and disseminate best practices for how can NGOs uh, collect and share evidence uh, on attacks on journalists and how they can share them with uh, jurisdictions or entities able to uh, prosecute these crimes. And finally, uh, the third set of recommendations really tries to tackle how do you increase the political cost uh, for perpetrators of attacks. Um, and here again, you know, the report actually goes through the, the plethora of UN resolutions that have been adopted over the last decades by the Security Council, by the General Assembly, by the Human Rights Council, by UNESCO's governing bodies. And yet, despite, uh, you know, these important tools that are being developed, there is to date still almost no cost. And what uh, the report uh, recommends is to increase uh, the cost on perpetrators by highlighting the worst violators uh, at the UN level. And again, uh, the approach of highlighting the worst violators is not something out of the blue. It's actually been uh, used in the, um, in the case uh, to tackle the problem of uh, children in armed conflict where basically the UN Secretary General is required every year to submit to the Security Council a list of countries and armed groups that commit the gravest violations against children in armed conflict. And the report basically says, well, something very similar should be adopted uh, for the worst violators and the worst perpetrators of attacks against journalists. Because this tool has been described as very powerful by advocacy groups working on reducing uh, abuses on children in armed conflict. And we believe uh, it can have the same effect. And basically, the architecture of setting this up uh, is already in place. It will just require a small push. We know the UN Secretary General already reports every year to the Security Council, but also to the General Assembly about attacks on journalists. But to date, the, the reports, while they describe many situations, they don't actually specifically list the worst offenders. Uh, and uh, our argument is, by not being very specific, by not offenders, this of these reports on changing the behavior. Because when you, um, in the case, for instance, of attacks uh, and, and violations on children in armed conflict, when a country gets listed as one of the worst violators, it's not just listing uh, that matters. It's actually, if you want to get off the list, the country has to adopt a, a, an action plan valid by the UN, which actually uh, tracks then very specific commitments to address the issue. So uh, we believe something similar should be adopted and actually compiling this list of worst violators would not be challenging at all given the important role of, of NGOs such as uh, RSF, CPJ, and others who've developed very helpful indexes on uh, the worst violators, but also the UN's own reporting, notably UNESCO, uh, notably the various human rights mechanisms, but also uh, through the information that is usually compiled these days as part of the indicator 6.10.1 of the Sustainable Development Goals, which tracks many of these things. Um, so the idea is inclusion, inclusion on the list would lead to a range of uh, measures, including potentially sanctions, with the idea of basically making those who are promoting this impunity pay a political price as a, uh, as a step towards judicial uh, accountability. And we, you know, we have a number of recommendations of how to strengthen the UN's internal uh, mechanisms to produce such a list and follow up. Uh, and here we endorse the, the, the call by various members of civil society, 
uh, on having a special representative within the UN report to the Secretary General and tackling the protection of journalists. Uh, this is basically, I think, in, in, uh, in short, uh, what the report focuses on. Thank you very much. One quick uh, quest, last question. How many members, and I think you, you said it, but is there a mechanism within the high level as to expand uh, the, the membership, for lack of a better word, to additional states? Is that in, in the project? How many states, ideally, before a multilateral uh, measure of this kind or, or idea of this kind could happen? Yes. So, um, yes, so the, the, I should distinguish here. So the Media Freedom Coalition, that actually set up the high level panel uh, is a, uh, you know, the members are member states and the numbers are increasing uh, all the time. So all that members need to do to join is basically they sign the global pledge on media freedom, which is a written commitment that they engage themselves to improve media freedom, first of all, domestically in their own countries, but that they will work together internationally uh, to do uh, to do so, and uh, it has to date. Uh, I believe the latest number I have is 49 countries have actually become members of the Media Freedom uh, Media Freedom Coalition, and they have signed the pledge. And these 49 countries uh, basically come from different parts of the uh, of the world. What would it require to have an effective uh, multilateral mechanism? I would say it would just require a core group of states. They don't even need to be 49. I think uh, a handful of really committed states, ideally from different parts of the world, who are willing to put in the human and financial resources in, the, uh, in creating this standing uh, task force, but also to provide it with the backup, because you know while this would be a, a multilateral body, they would need to provided with the backup politically to ensure it is known, it can work in different parts of the world and so forth. Um, you know, we can get very technical about how is the best way to create such a multilateral uh, task force. And the report goes through a number of models that have been adopted. One way to do so would be to host it an existing um, well-established international organizations, you know, uh, uh, the report, for instance, highlights that maybe this is something that can be hosted by the International Bar Association, just to get it off the ground in a much faster way. So using, instead of having to start from zero, you would actually uh, host it by an existing institution. But there could also be uh, different models of uh, multilateralism. But I think really the fundamental argument here is we should no longer accept that, you know, veto power at the UN or uh, political blockages by the powerful prevent concerted action by concerned states. Thank you very much for your contribution. Thank you for the opportunity.